One of the biggest questions that I get asked is how I was able to go from working a nine to five job at a tech startup to leaving my job and transitioning into becoming a full-time content creator. It can certainly look like a lot of fun to quit your job and create content on Instagram, but there is so much thought that went into that decision for me and a lot of it came down to money. Today I want to share what I did exactly to feel financially prepared to take my content creation full time as well as some of the things that I do now to feel financially stable and secure even as someone who's self-employed. Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. My name is Austin and I am a fashion and beauty content creator based in New York City. I use this channel to help micro-influencers create great content, grow their digital brands, and generate sustainable income from content creation. So if any of that interests you, please do consider subscribing to my channel for new videos every Tuesday. Now, I've been creating content online for just under 10 years, and I always loved having a blog and social media platforms as a creative outlet that was totally in my control. I'd always kind of fantasized a little bit about the idea of going full-time with my content creation, but I really had to sit down and think about what it would actually take for me to go through with it once that itch started to become something I couldn't really ignore. And by the way, I do have some other videos here on my channel about when I decided to quit my job and what my game plan was for being a full-time content creator, so you can watch those if you're interested. But I really wanted to talk about how I prepared financially to take my content creation full time. I know that money can be something we sometimes attach fear to. I know I was totally guilty of that and still am a little bit if I'm being completely honest, just in terms of wondering if I'm ever going to run out of it or if I can make enough of it to feel comfortable and live my life in addition to running my business. And I did a newsletter about this topic two weeks ago that you guys really seemed to enjoy and that seemed to resonate with you. So I wanted to bring this topic over to YouTube to go a little bit more in depth and be able to talk about it more. And by the way, if you're not subscribed to my newsletter, that is free. It goes out every Wednesday. You can subscribe from the link down below. So in this video, I'm going to talk through the five things I did to prepare financially to go out on my own and leave my full-time job. And I also want to talk through some of my most frequently asked questions about how I maintain financial security and stability now as a self-employed person. Before I get into the five things that I did to feel financially secure and prepared to leave my full-time job, I do think it's helpful to share a little bit of background on my personal situation, just so you can understand for context. I know money is really personal and different for everyone, by the way. What worked for me might not work for you, but I just wanted to share a little bit of my background in terms of money and also just my upbringing. A little bit of background on me. I grew up in Bergen County, New Jersey. Um, I'm an only child and I would say that I absolutely had a very comfortable upbringing. I'm also really grateful that I grew up with parents who helped teach me about personal finance and financial literacy kind of throughout my childhood, even just with little things like if I got money from my birthday, maybe setting aside some for college and thinking about what you want to spend it on before you just go run and buy the first thing that you see. I was also really lucky to have a well-paying job before this. Like I said, I was working at a tech startup. I was the beauty content director there. Um, I graduated from college with no debt or student loans, which I'm really grateful for. My parents very kindly and generously helped me pay for college, and I also saved and put my own money towards college as well. And I also don't have uh, kids, I don't have pets, and I rent an apartment that I share with my boyfriend. So as I've said, again, money is so personal and different for everyone, but I do think it's important for me to share this context so that you can see where I'm coming from and how I think about money, and that might be a little different from how you think about it. So the first thing that I did was basically get my finances in order beyond just having a checking account. So I have a brokerage account and have now invested money in the stock market. I had money in this account that was kind of just sitting in cash and I consulted my dad and my boyfriend, uh, my boyfriend who works in the financial industry and then my dad who, um, again, like I said, growing up, he really taught me financial literacy and I trust his decision making and his insights into this to help me invest my money in the stock market so that it can grow over time and so it's not just sitting in an account, not earning interest and not growing. The other thing that I did in this kind of category was make sure that I had a retirement account. So I've had a retirement account for several years, but I also really wanted to 
basically max out my contributions to it and get as much money saved for the future as possible so that I already know I am starting to invest at that point in my life and that that will be something that I will be very grateful for once I am able to access the account. I forget what age it is, but it's not going to be for a while. So that money in there is untouched and is completely specifically for retirement. And by the way, you can start so small with these things and I'm not the person to ask about what stocks to buy and things like that, but there are tons of great resources out there for you. So do your due diligence and ask around. The second thing that I did was basically create a rainy day fund where I wanted to be able to save up for at least six months of living expenses before I left my full-time job so that even if I didn't earn a cent somehow in my journey as a full-time content creator and in my first few months kind of getting my footing. And so for me, that meant things like being able to pay my rent and my bills, of course, but also to go out to dinner with a friend if they asked and feel okay saying yes. Having that six month, you know, rainy day fund, emergency fund, whatever you want to call it, that I knew I could pay myself from even if I wasn't getting work right away, which luckily turned out not to be the case, but it just gave me such a peace of mind knowing that that money was there. And it was also kind of lighting a fire under my butt, so to speak, because it was like, okay, if that money runs out, then what are you going to do? And that was, you know, I'm kind of motivated and excited by the idea that the money that I make is totally up to me. Some people might be completely terrified of that. And if that's you, that's completely understandable. And this can be a more long-term goal, or you can continue to vlog on the side. It's all what you want to do. And we're going to talk later on in this video, like I said, about how I now still feel financially secure and I'm coming up on my one year anniversary of leaving my job. The third thing that I did was try to line up as many potential clients, brand partners, people who I thought might want to hire me at some point in one way or another to start working with them or give them a heads up that I was going to become a self-employed content creator so that I would have people who were already kind of lined up and ready to work with me once I stopped my full-time job. And one of those clients who I ended up doing freelance work with actually turned out to be my former employer, which was so great because I totally loved the product that we were building and I loved the team that I was working with and I wanted to still be a part of it in some capacity. I just knew that I really had other things I wanted to focus on as well. So I was able to do a three month contract with them after leaving my full time role and I basically did some freelance work for them, which was so great too, just knowing that I had three months of some steady income and that that was going to be in addition to my rainy day fund and give me a good baseline. This was also the time where I started getting some inquiries about consulting and I did not have a interest form like I have now or any sort of method or process of how I did consulting. I honestly just kind of got on some calls with friends. I think they Venmoed me like maybe $50 at the time just to, you know, kind of get the ball rolling on something like that. And once I knew that I was able to test that in a small capacity, I understood and knew that it could become a bigger part of my income as a full-time self-employed creator. The fourth thing that I did was I had some really honest conversations with my parents, with a few close friends, and with my boyfriend who I share this apartment and my living expenses with about my decision to do this and what my plan was financially. I did try to put myself in Andrew's shoes and think about how I would feel if he came to me and said, hey, so I'm going to quit my job tomorrow. I know it pays well, I know I have health insurance, but I'm just gonna go out on my own and do this thing. And I know if it were me, I would feel a lot more comfortable with that. I mean, I'd be excited first and foremost, I think, but I'd be a lot more comfortable with it, again, given that we do share living expenses, that I would want to know what the plan was. Sure, if you wanna leave, that's great, how are you going to make that work? And the fifth and final thing that I did was research what some of my expenses might turn out to be as a full-time content creator. So that included things like remembering that now when I get paid from someone, I get paid in the full amount, but I still have to report my income and pay taxes on my income. So I usually set aside between 20, more like 25%, I would say, 
of the money I make to pay estimated quarterly tax payments. I also had to go out and find my own health insurance. Um, I am not able to be on my parents anymore. I'm 27, I know I need to be a grown up. And I didn't have health insurance coming from an employer anymore. So, yeah, so those are other things you need to think about. If you want like a full list and details about what some of your expenses might be as a full-time content creator, I do actually have an entire video dedicated to that right here. So I'll be sure to link it down below in the description box. You can go check it out after you watch this one. Okay, so let's quickly recap those five things that I did. Number one, get my finances in order with investing in the stock market and opening a retirement account. Number two, having a rainy day fund with, for me, it was six months worth of money that could cover all of my expenses. Number three was lining up potential clients and brand partners before I even left my job. Number four was having serious chats and conversations about my boyfriend who I live with and also my parents and other close people to me about how I was going to really make this work financially. And number five was researching what my expenses and costs might be as someone who is self-employed and running a business. And I want to get into basically the three most frequently asked questions about money that I receive as a self-employed content creator. So let's get into those. Number one is a pretty general one. It's typically like, okay, so but how do you make money? And I think what people really mean by that or how I like to rephrase that question is, you know, what are some of the different ways that creators can make money? I personally have eight different income streams, eight different ways that I bring in money from my social media platforms and blog to myself. The reason I think it's so important to diversify your revenue streams as a content creator is one of them could potentially go away without any notice or control from you. And if it does, you wanna make sure that you still have something to catch you, like a safety net, just in case that happens. I actually also have a whole video where I do a deeper dive of my income streams, so I'll be sure to link this one down below in the description box as well. But really having these different income streams just gives me so much peace of mind. And not only that, but it gives me a lot of different ways I can go about spending my time creating content and what I can choose to focus on so that I am bringing in money from different sources, but also just so that my days are always different and interesting and I get to focus on a lot of different things that I'm passionate about. I think as a creator, sometimes it's hard to reconcile, you know, is this thing that I'm doing right now actively going to make me money? Or am I doing something that maybe won't make me money right now, but will help me meet potentially a different goal? So even filming this YouTube video today, for example, my biggest thing with YouTube is I love using it as a place to connect. Also, you know, I mean, I'm not getting paid to sit here right now and talk to you by a brand, right? This video is not sponsored by a brand of any kind but I am part of the YouTube partner program. And so when I post this video, I will make ad revenue from it over time. So that's one great way for me to kind of get paid to create content. And it really just requires you sitting through an ad, which I hope we're all just super accustomed to ads now because I kind of don't even notice them anymore. My first and biggest priority on YouTube is really to share this information, create educational and inspiring videos and connect with my ideal audience members. The second question is more about payment terms. So how long does it take for you to get paid by the time you're done with a project? And the answer is it depends. And this is something so important to think about before you decide to quit your full-time job. At a full-time job, you get paid every two weeks and you get paid the same amount every two weeks. Whenever you have a contract with a new client, make sure that you check to see that there is a clause included about the payment terms. So how you're going to be paid, whether it's by direct deposit or getting a check mailed or through PayPal or whatever the payment source is, and also thinking about the timeline. So if you see net 15, that means that you'll get paid 15 days after you finish the project or submit an invoice, whatever it says in your contract. Net 30 is becoming a bit more standard, I would say, in the industry, which I appreciate, but that is still a long time to wait to get paid. There's also, watch out for these, net 60 and net 90 payments sometimes. And if you can push back and negotiate on those, definitely try to. It is so crazy to me to think that sometimes it just takes two months to pay someone money for something they already did. And it's very weird. I would love for freelancers and self-employed people to have a better way to do this in the future or a way to get money faster. And it's just, 
we're getting there. We have a lot of work to do. So definitely, again, something to keep in mind. And that's another reason why it was great to have that rainy day fund for my first few weeks out on my own, because even though I was getting some work and getting some projects, it still took time, you know, to get that money actually deposited back into my account. So I was able to pay myself from the rainy day fund. In the meantime, it was almost like having a salary of some kind. I just paid myself a set amount whenever I needed it. And yeah. And the last question is related and it's basically how do you deal then with getting a different size paycheck each month or having a different amount of money that you make each month? And I think that one of the best things I've been able to do to really make sure that I do have consistent income in my business is to pick and choose revenue streams that do allow me to get paid passively and also consistently over time. Again, for example, with YouTube's partner program, I basically get a check from Google and YouTube every month. And at this point, I can pretty much anticipate the amount of money that it's going to be based on my video's performance and how many views I get. So it's great to know that that is going to show up every month. I also usually get sales from my digital products. I also have ads on my website and those tend to be pretty consistent income streams and they are also now passive income streams for me because I create the content once and then it can sell over and over again if I've made a digital product or again, if you guys find my videos and watch them over time too, I still get paid for the ad revenue from the video ads. Even starting small and trying to think like, okay, how can I get $100 consistently each month? And then scaling it up, how can I get $500 consistently each month? How can I get 1000 That is something that is so important to think about. If you're more interested in monetizing from a service perspective and doing brand partnerships, you know, trying to sign a long-term brand partnership where you get paid a set amount over a few months is a really great way to do that. I'm also lucky with my consulting clients. Like I try to work with people who I think are a good match for me. And sometimes when we are wrapping up a session, they'll already say like, I would love to schedule a follow-up call with you. And so I know that I am able to offer that to them and give them a chance to, you know, work with me again, which is really exciting. So thinking about what can I build that's consistent and what can I build that is making money and doing things even if I take a break. And if you're looking for any advice in regards to searchable platforms like a blog and a YouTube channel so that you can grow your page views on that and make more money from ad revenue, I did just want to share that the link to my SEO masterclass waitlist is live. You can sign up for the waitlist. I'll leave the link down below in the description box for the SEO masterclass that I'm going to be hosting later this spring. So no date announced yet, but get on the waitlist and you will get notified and have all the juicy details about when we choose a date and how that will work. So definitely sign up down below on the waitlist and I hope to see you in that class. I feel like we really covered a lot today, but if you have anything you want to ask me or something that I didn't mention in this video, please leave me a comment down below. I always do my best to read and respond to as many of those as I can. If you're not already, please consider subscribing to my channel. I would love to have you as a subscriber and you can even turn on the notifications so that you get notified whenever I upload a new video. And lastly, please also give this video a like down below if it did help you out or if it inspired you or if you just straight up liked it. I'll be back again next week with another new video. Until then, thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day, and I will see you soon. Bye. The only reason I keep sneaking.